amor sempre foi assunto para poetas e namorados. Agora a ciência resolveu se meter com o amor e passou a traduzir os sentimentos mais ternos na linguagem complicada da química do cérebro. Dopamina, serotonina, neurotransmissores. Mas nem assim o amor ficou sem graça e mistério. Poetas românticos como Charles Baudelaire e Anna Armatova inspiram as pesquisas da antropóloga Ellen Fischer, que popularizou o estudo da química do amor nos livros Por que Amamos, lançado no Brasil, e Why Him, Why Her, Por que Ele, Por que Ela, que acaba de lançar aqui nos Estados Unidos. Depois de explicar como e por que a gente ama, Ellen ficou mais ambiciosa. Agora, ela tenta descobrir a fórmula para explicar por que, nas palavras do poeta, João amava Teresa, que amava Raimundo, que amava Maria, que amava Joaquim, que amava Lili, que não amava ninguém. You put people uh, in uh, brain scans to find out what is that uh, explains in the brain romantic love. What have you found? I and my colleagues have now scanned 49 people, 17 who have just fallen madly in love, 15 who have just been rejected in love, and 17 who report that they're still in love, not just feeling deep attachment, but in love after an average of 21 years of marriage. And there's some things we found in all three groups. And one of them was activity in a tiny little factory near the base of the brain called the ventral tegmental area. And we found activity in cells that actually make dopamine, which is a natural stimulant, and send dopamine to many brain regions. So what happens when you're in love, um, particularly that very early stage of intense romantic love, um, um, you focus on a person, you want them. This is a craving. It's an obsession. There's something, somebody camping in your head. What people will do when they are in love is absolutely stunning. And what about the people who had been rejected? In our people who had been rejected, we found activity in some of the basic regions associated with addiction, with powerful, fundamental cocaine addiction. Romantic love is a perfectly wonderful addiction when things are going well, and a perfectly horrible addiction when things are going poorly. But um, it's a craving, it's an obsession. Um, no wonder people live for love, they kill for love, they die for love, they sing about love, we have myths and legends about love, we've got um, uh, love potions, uh, love charms, love magic, everywhere in the world people love. Yeah, but now we have the scientific tools to look at uh, the chemistry, right? the brain chemistry of it. Yeah. So you mentioned dopamine, what does the dopamine do? What dopamine does is it stimulates you, it's a natural stimulant. It gives you focus, and this is why the lover so focuses on every single part of their sweetheart. As a matter of fact, the people who I put into the machine could list what they did not like about their sweetheart, but then they would uh, go right back and sweep that aside and focus on what they did like. Uh, dopamine gives you focus, it gives you intense motivation, goal-oriented behavior, it can give you tremendous anxiety actually, um, real mood swings as it goes up and down, it gives you a real energy, this is why lovers can walk all night, uh, talk till dawn, um, it stimulates the sex drive, it triggers testosterone to trigger the st sex drive, so you feel a general optimism, uh, energy, focus, enthusiasm, and um, intense romantic love. But there were also, besides the people who just fell in love, people in long-term relationships. Was that the same? We wondered whether people who report that they're still in love in a long-term relationship would have exactly the same brain response as those who had just fallen in love. So we did exactly the same experiment that we did among people who had just fallen in love, among people who reported that they were still in love after an average of 21 years of marriage. And indeed, we found activity in the same little factory near the base of the brain, the ventral tegmental area, in the brain region that actually makes dopamine and sends this natural stimulant to many brain regions, giving you that energy, the optimism, the focus, the craving, the motivation. But we found some differences between those who had just fallen in love and those who were in love long term. And that was we found new activity in a brain region associated with feelings of attachment, uh, the ventral pallidum, and we also found activity in little brain regions associated with calm and pain relief. And so what we think is going on in a long-term in-love relationship is you still want to see the person, talk to the person, share with the person, can't wait for the person to get home, uh, spend your spare time with the person, but you don't have that early anxiety. Uh, so if they don't call, you don't spend the night in tears. But why does love end? 
Nobody really knows why it is that romantic love uh, begins to dissipate. It doesn't have to. If you choose the right person and if you do novel things together, you can sustain feelings of romantic love. But it often does begin to move into a different kind of feeling, a feeling of deep attachment to a partner or um, angst and revolt from the relationship, one or the other. I think that one of the reasons that high intensity begins to wane is because it wouldn't have been adaptive. For millions of years, I think romantic love evolved to enable us to focus our mating energy on just one individual at a time and to start the mating process. But it would have been adaptive to then move into feelings of deep attachment for this partner so you could raise your babies in a more calm, relaxed state. So romantic love is not just some uh, uh, cultural phenomenon. It's, it's a human drive, right? I think romantic love is a basic human drive. I think it is one of three basic uh, drives that evolve for mating and reproduction. I think the sex drive evolved to get you out there looking for a whole range of partners. I think romantic love evolved to enable you to focus your energy on just one at a time. And I think the third brain system of attachment evolved to enable you to tolerate this person, to stick with them at least long enough to raise a single child through infancy together as a team. But what's interesting is these three brain systems can sometimes work together. For example, you fall in love with somebody and suddenly everything about them is sexually exciting. But they can also operate separately. You can feel deep attachment for one person while you feel intense romantic love for somebody else, while you feel the sex drive for a range of partners. So um, you can even lie in bed at night and swing from feelings of deep attachment to one person to feelings of wild romantic love for somebody else. So it's, um, uh, I'm not sure we were built to be happy. We were built to reproduce. Are men's and women's brains different in that respect? I had anticipated that we would find no differences between the male and the female brain. I mean, they both have to fall in love. They both have to reproduce. Um, I think this is like the sex drive. There may be some variations in how it's expressed, but the basic feeling is the same. And that's what we found. Men just show just as much elation, just as much motivation, just as much craving, just as much as obsessive thinking as women did. But we did find two differences in the brain. Among our...